from this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. America will start winning again, winning like never before. We will shine as an example for everyone to follow. At the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. Flag! Turn that flag up! And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. How are you? You need to take that shit off. Be with us. The Bible tells us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, but always pursue solidarity. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. God bless America. Welcome to New York City, the construction capital of the world. In this town, real estate is king. From Manhattan to the Bronx, Brooklyn to Queens, the Big Apple skyline is one of the world's most iconic. And over the years, one name in particular became synonymous with the city's ever-changing urban landscape. From stakes to board games, Trump's never been afraid to attach his name to anything that could make him money. And by 2016, one building hadn't been bestowed in the Trump name, but this one wasn't in New York City. I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. The 16 election was one that was marred by great levels of polarization. The experience of the Obama presidency radicalized a lot of Republicans. Citizens from white America felt that their needs weren't being heard, that they were slowly becoming a minority, and they were really afraid of this prospect. Through his rhetoric,
Trump was able to tap into these fears and amplify them. So we take a killer, a drug lord, a vicious gang, bring them back to their countries, and then say, turn that plane around and get them out. The environment in U.S. politics was, was pretty intense. It was already pretty polarized. There were already issues uh, and the need to come together. And Trump came in, like many autocratic populists do, and, and he made everything worse. Populist leaders are usually charismatic, both internally and externally. And by that, I mean they have a very strong emotional bond with the people. The messaging that they give to voters is usually binary. There is good, there is evil, there is no room for ambiguity, there is no room for nuance, for complication. It is a very simplistic binary appeal. Populism's discourse has never changed. Okay, you just look at fascist Germany, fascist Italy. It's that suspicion of other people, it's that hatred of other people that you think are going to represent a threat to your way of life and to your personal security. In many ways, the populism we see today is identical to the populism we saw 100 years ago. From the beginning, Trump decided to appeal to, to the far right, to the fringes of the Republican Party that were flirting with white supremacy. When he came out in one of his campaign speeches and he talked about the threat coming from Mexico. We have some bad hombres here and we're gonna get them out. And he said it unapologetically. And this really resonated with those white Americans that harbored these latent or maybe not so latent racist feelings. Now, typically with populist movements in the West, it's kind of white working class, lower middle class people regarding their way of life or an imagined past being under threat by newcomers to that society. And, and when people are feeling poor, when people are feeling financially insecure, they're looking to blame someone. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. Members of the Republican establishment couldn't stand him. Everything he stood for opposed their own political ideas. They claimed to be the party of conservative family values, and they didn't want Trump to get the nomination. But Trump started to gain steam. He was able to really overpower other Republican candidates, and it was a very wide field. But during these debates, he would completely just overpower everybody else. You know, you're a tough guy, Jeb. He would bully them. But then his poll numbers tanked. He's got very, that's why he's on the end. He degraded the level of decency. We don't need a weak person being president of the United States, okay? <laughs> it was basically a shouting fest. In the polls, but you're not beating Hillary. So but you're not know. beating Hillary. Well, then if I can't, if, hey, if I can't beat her, you're really going to get killed, aren't you? And he was able to throw insults at people that were so low, they, they just were lower than we had ever heard before. She said he's a pussy. And then that brought other candidates down to his level. But by projecting this image of strength, he really resonated with Republican Party voters. And he would eventually win the nomination by May of 2016. Once Trump gained the nomination, he set his sights on going after Hillary Clinton, engaging in a series of personal attacks against her. She's the worst secretary of state. Crooked Hillary Clinton. She doesn't care at all. And when one of his advisors, Steve Bannon, got involved in the campaign, they started engaging in conspiracy theories about her health, that, that she wouldn't be well enough or stable enough to, to actually uh, become president. 
if you look at the evolution of Trumpism, if you want to call it that, which clearly Steve Bannon had some influence over, uh, as we've gone on from 2016, that has become a much more openly conspiratorial ideology. He eventually went after Bill Clinton's affairs, even though he himself was facing all kinds of accusations of sexual misconduct, sexual, sexual assault, of rape, and these accusations were, were coming in large numbers against him, particularly after the Access Hollywood tape came out. This came out at a very critical time in the campaign, on October 7th, so roughly you know, weeks before people are gonna vote on November 9th. There was this tape that came out where he was bragging about assaulting women. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. Any other candidate would have given up. But instead, Donald Trump just doubled down. He said, this is locker room talk. This is something that is completely normal. Uh, and he carried on. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. Let's go inside and Thank get you. out of this heat. Thank Come you. Come on. Is there anything he could say that would put you off? No. I've got a choice between the clown and a criminal. I'll take the clown. And frankly, the clown doesn't really look like that much of a clown anymore. And he even show, showed up to the debate that happened just you know a few weeks later on October 20th with more energy and vitriol than, than ever before. He really went after Clinton about her being a corrupt person, her being immoral, her being someone that you couldn't be trusted, her being part of the swamp that need to be drained. And then, of course, we have crooked Hillary. Crooked Hillary, fuck. She's been crooked from the beginning, and to think that she has a shot at being our president. And though his approval ratings had dipped considerably because of this Access Hollywood tape and people feeling so uneasy about him, it was only 11 days before the election that he received an incredibly helpful surprise. And this Fox News alert now, the Associated Press is suing the State Department in federal court to try to force the release of government documents and emails from Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. When I got to work as Secretary of State, I opted for convenience to use my personal email account. She put us all at risk. Which was allowed. Yeah, it's going to bury her. She's going to go to prison. Because I thought it would be easier. Here's a Secretary of State with a server that she's not supposed to have. Looking back, it would have been better if I simply used a second email account. Well, again, she's going to have a tough time trying to, trying to get out of this one, so. I thought using one device would be simpler. She put us all at risk. And obviously, it hasn't worked out that way. Do you feel something's changing? Uh, well, it's, it's going to be like Brexit. It's uh, the polls are going to show Hillary winning, and when we wake up on the 9th, Trump is going to be our president. Trump really became a master of the big set pieces, the big rallies, the arenas, using charisma, using new media, alternative media, and being completely willing and enthusiastic to attack established media. In some respects, it was, a, it was a fusion of the old and the new. And in 2016, for whatever, for lots of reasons we now know, he did understand mass psychology and he did outflank much of the elite. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. Complicated. Thank you very much. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. She congratulated us, it's about us, on our victory. And I congratulated her. Crooked Hillary Clinton. 
and her family on a very, very hard-fought campaign. I mean, she, she fought very hard. Trump didn't think he would win. They were all, they were as shell-shocked as everybody else. There's lots of evidence to suggest um, Trump would have lots of conversations with people about this. You know, he was thinking about this as it was a marketing opportunity. They were planning all sorts of things for the post-election and period. None of them involved governing. None of them involved in being president. None of them involved the White House. The key to Trump's victory was that he represented what to many people was renewal and change and a sweeping away of what was seen in the form of Hillary Clinton as an old, stale, corrupt political There are enough disaffected Americans, disaffected with their own lives, with the political process, with the political parties, with the polarization, who are prepared to vote for a candidate who seems on his face to be outlandish, who seems to be on his face unpresidential, um, and they're prepared to take a risk. Trump represented something dynamic, something new, something very simple that just pulled at American heartstrings. Make America great again. He was hearkening to autocratic leaders that tried to make their publics, their citizens, nostalgic about the past. The most important word in that is again. It's this idea there was a time where everything was perfect. And that is what these movements seek to, to bring about. That is what uh, Benito Mussolini tried to do with Italy. That's what Hitler tried to do with Germany. That's what Trump tried to do with America. Uh, it is, you know, the whole Brexit thing was bringing Britain back to an imagined past that never really existed. And Trump is trying to bring America back to an imagined past where everything's perfect, where there are, frankly, no differences, where there is just basically one racial type, you know, where, where it is everything is just perfect and white. And with a president now more on side with right-wing views, dangerous fringe groups in America would soon feel more heard than ever before. Donald John Trump do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. On the 20th of January, 2017, Donald Trump's term as President of the United States of America began. His inauguration was the formal culmination of the transition of power from the former President, Barack Obama. And whilst many around the world protested the new president, the right wing of politics hoped the Trump presidency would be the start of a bold new conservative vision for America. Well, the first 100 days started off really badly with him, just with the inauguration. There was all kinds of accusations of corruption and embezzlement of funds with his inaugural committee. There was his uh, press secretary, Sean Spicer, very vociferously, loudly, adamantly claiming this was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. Photographic evidence proved otherwise. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. And then there was one of the largest marches in, in U.S. history, the Women's March, when you know, all kinds of women, men, children, everyone marched upon Washington protesting his presidency his behavior towards women, his policies towards women. That's what started off his presidency. There's probably never been a, a transition like it. In part, that's because Trump didn't have around him people who knew how Washington worked. He had no experienced advisors who, you know, been part of an administration, who'd been part of a White House before. They were all ignorant, and none more so than Bannon. 
Steve Bannon's role was to run Donald Trump's campaign to become president. And when Trump did get into the White House, Bannon then joined him on his staff as an advisor, a very key advisor. And what Bannon's there to do is to say to Trump, this is the direction of travel. These are the type of policies that we should bring about. You know, you have this mandate to sort of create chaos, if you like, to sort of overturn the system, to look at everything afresh, not to obey the normal rules of politics and diplomacy and, 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 and bureaucracy. It's actually to, you know, almost start again, re-examine everything with a fresh pair of eyes. Now, you know, to some people that felt like a very liberating thing to do. To other people, that looked like anarchy. Steve Bannon is somebody that wants to roll back the frontiers of the state to make it more representative of his particular view of the world. You know, I'm, I'm a populist. I think he's an economic nationalist and that he's deeply critical of where globalization has gone. I believe in, 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 the, in, in the people. And I think he is a nationalist in wanting to prioritize the culture and the interests of the nation state. I believe in the people of the United States. I believe in this activity that we just started in Europe. I believe in the little guy. Against a corrupt, self-serving and distant elite. So I'm not, I'm not there to be friends of people in government or not friends. And Bannon hadn't worked in politics until a few months before. His first job in politics was as Trump's campaign manager in August 2016. And a few months later, they're in the White House. And none of them knew how to run a White House or a federal bureaucracy of several, several million employers or how to staff the administration. They had no idea. What Bannon sees in Trump is a like-minded figure, a disruptor, someone who doesn't want to obey the rules, someone who looks at the state as it is and thinks that it's broken and dirty and corrupt. Are you a citizen of the United States of America? Because if you're a citizen, there's certain responsibility and obligations that come with that. But as a citizen also, you should have preference for jobs and economic opportunities. He is the, the new way of the Republican Party, which has always been the conservative way. And it's time that either the Republicans become Republicans or they, they go register as Democrats or independents and get out of our way. Political parties in America are, are very broad churches. You know, there's 330 million people and there's two parties. So they've always represented coalitions of, of interests. But in the Republican Party today, we have uh, a, a tension, or at least as Bannon saw it, between uh, his wing, which wanted to represent you know, the ordinary white working class American, and the sort of establishment Republicans who represent, you know, moneyed elites. You know, they are, that, and that position is antithetical to Bannon's position, which is to represent the white working class. And so there's this tension. Bannon hated the Paul Ryan wing of the party as much as he hated Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. So yes, I mean, he, he was, he wanted to destroy that segment of the Republican party, yes. And Trump was a, a, his weapon of choice. So within his first 100 days, he had a pretty low approval rating. Now it's interesting, that approval rating, which hovered around 40%, really never wavered throughout his presidency. It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter if he did the most horrible thing or did the greatest thing. He was always going to be the same approval rating. And that then drew attention to the fact that he had this base that was this unmovable, unshakable base that no one could really penetrate. And that made the Republicans very afraid of ever messing. And he formed a personality cult. He personalized politics. It was all about him. He formed direct linkages with people. He connected with people, playing into their fears. And it was successful in, in doing so. And, and, and they viewed him as a messianic type of figure, that he was saving them from all these problems, that they couldn't survive without him.
you know, going back to to 9/11. So we're going back almost a couple of decades or a decade and a half. Islam is becomes to be seen by some people on the right as a dangerous ideology, um, as a revolutionary ideology, and there, you know, there's a there's a couple of sort of domestic terror incidents in the United States. There was a shooting in San Bernardino in California during the 2016 campaign, which triggered Trump to come out and say that he was going to stop all Muslims entering the United States until they could figure out what the hell was going on. We have seen the devastation at home from 9-11 to Boston to San Bernardino and many, many other places. We've seen attacks overseas in France, in Germany, in Belgium. It's time for intelligence and common sense to be used. The single best way to protect, and you have to do this, you have to do this, and to keep foreign terrorists from attacking our country is to keep these foreign terrorists from entering our country in the first place. He was pilloried for that. Every, nearly every sort of mainstream and some not mainstream Republicans came out and, and, and condemned his, his comments as just on their face racist. Trump, as he usually does, refused to backtrack, refused to apologize. If you hate our country, if you're not happy here, you can leave. And that's what I say all the time. That's what I said in a tweet, which I guess some people think is controversial. A lot of people love it, by the way. A lot of people love it. And that, 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 that statement about banning all Muslims entering the United States is what forms the basis of the travel ban. Of course, the travel ban only applies to sort of seven or so countries. It's much, it's much narrower, but it's still incendiary because it still appears appears it does, you know, directly prevent the, the immigration of a certain class of peoples, Muslims. I thought that was an obvious move for, for Trump and Bannon to make. I think it as I say, it polls very well among their core voters. It taps into issues of security and is something that I think is designed to be a wedge issue, to really drive a wedge between what you might call the, the kind of liberal political media class and Trump and Bannon. And I think that's what that policy was designed to do. And I think it was probably pretty effective at doing it. There are voices uh, in the sort of alt-right world which very much view Islam as a, as a dangerous ideology. Some go as far as, you know, sort of thinking about the, 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 the this is a conflict between Christianity uh, and, and Islam. And it's a key aspect of, of sort of alt-right ideology, this idea that there's a, you know, going to be a clash of civilizations, you know, using Samuel Huntington's terminology here. But you know, but taking that idea further, and that there's a, there's going to be a battle between the, these two different worlds. So Charlottesville was this white nationalist rally that took place in August of 2017. And it was probably one of the lowest moments in Trump's presidency and probably one of the lowest moments in any US president's presidency. There was an opportunity for Trump to condemn the march of the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis, to unequivocally criticize what they were doing and who they stood for. But instead of doing that, he was so afraid to upset his base that he refused to condemn them. And this was even after someone died. Go, 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 go. And in 
instead of coming, you know, under no uncertain terms, this is unacceptable. He said, well, there are good people on both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. This was a really important moment for the white supremacists. He's signaling to them that you're okay, that you are legitimate. You're no longer on the fringe. You're no longer considered white wing terrorists. You are accepted into this big tent that is a Republican party. And, and that really galvanized white supremacists. Uh, and, and they were completely motivated after his lukewarm reaction. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Trump had a love-hate relationship with the press. He loved the fact that they gave him more attention than any other candidate. He loved the fact that he had Fox News that was basically under his thumb. It was pretty much his mouthpiece. We're going to have over 400 miles of wall built by the end of next year. The wall is very important. But he hated being criticized by major news outlets like CNN and MSNBC. I'm not finished fake news. You are fake news. And so he denigrated the press. He delegitimized the press. And this is a common tool in the tool book of wannabe dictators, particularly these populist autocratic leaders, that the first step that they want to take is actually delegitimizing the press so that any information that contradicts them or criticizes them is at least questioned by the public. And he wanted to cast doubt into the public's minds about all the different things that were being reported about him because he moved from one scandal to the next. So Trump's first impeachment uh, took place officially in December of 2019. And in the fall, there was reporting that Trump had called Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and had pressured him to investigate Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. And he was insinuating on this phone call that if he didn't do so, that the US would withhold very vital economic and military aid that the Ukrainians need. We have a president who's violated his oath of office a president who has put at risk our national security, a president who may, and that will be decide the decision of the Congress to make, may have committed a crime, and a president, and a president who, uh, who used the power of his office and your tax dollars to try to persuade a foreign leader to once again interfere in a presidential campaign. And this then led to an investigation. And then, of course, it would lead to Trump's first impeachment. And it would pass through the House, but he was not convicted. We have something that just worked out. I mean, it worked out. We went through hell unfairly, did nothing wrong, did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. Trump's impeachment saga was just another chaotic chapter of his presidency. Even after the chaos of the previous four years, the impeachment acquittal motivated his supporters and the MAGA crowd came out in full force to support Trump's 2020 re-election campaign. At rallies across America, the president continued where he left off in the last election, preaching about wanting to make America great again. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. America will soon be thriving like never before because, ladies and gentlemen of Oklahoma, the best is yet to come. Together, we will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. 
We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you. Thank you, Oklahoma. On November the 3rd, 2020, America went to the polls to cast their votes, and nobody could predict the chaos that would soon ensue. After four long, tense days, we've reached a historic moment in this election. We can now project the winner of the presidential race. For most Americans in 2020, four years of President Trump was enough. When all votes were counted, the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, officially became the president-elect. Meanwhile, Trump became the first president since George H.W. Bush to serve only one term in office. And whilst Democrat supporters celebrated, Trump didn't plan to leave the White House quietly. I just, again, I want to thank you. It's uh, just a great honor to have this kind of crowd and to be before you and hundreds of thousands of American patriots who are committed to the honesty of our elections and the integrity of our glorious republic. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. So the 6th of January was probably one of the darkest days in American history. This was a day that had been months in the planning. It was not spontaneous, though Trump would like people to believe that. He had spent months thinking that he wasn't going to win the election, or at least that was a possibility. So he tried to sow the seeds of doubt that the elections were illegitimate and that the U.S. was facing all kinds of electoral fraud, voter fraud, and that there would need to be something to be done about it, and that he had rightfully won the election. And he was able to galvanize his supporters to basically charge on the Capitol. Trump had tweeted, hadn't he, about, uh, he said to his supporters, be there, it'll be, it'll be wild. And it led to people dying. It was a bloody coup attempt. I mean, I don't know, what were they, what were they expecting? Did, did they, did they think? So there's a crowd outside the ellipse. Trump gives a speech. Other people give a speech. They encourage them to, you know, to, to, to march down to, to the to the to the Capitol to, to Congress. What did they expect would happen there? I think those events were clearly shaped by narratives that were rife on the right of American politics about the legitimacy or the perceived illegitimacy of the 2020 election. I think that they were 
narratives that were wholly focused on presenting the American elite as being manipulative, anti-democratic, and opposed to the, the view of the people, the, the voice of the, the forgotten people. I think it's certainly fair to say that many of the people who participated in those events were clearly influenced by the ideology of Trumpism. his plan and why it failed was his vice president, Mike Pence, was supposed to decertify the election results. But that, of course, would have been a violation of federal law. And his own lawyers were telling him, you know, you can't do that. And so then he was pretty much the only president in history that put a bounty on his own vice president's head. The radical left knows exactly what they're doing. They're ruthless. And it's time that somebody did something about it. And Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you, I will tell you right now. Mike Pence was only 40 feet away from the rioters. I mean, his life was in danger. And Trump did nothing. He did nothing to, to stop the rioters. He, he didn't intervene. He didn't tell them, I condemn this. He probably secretly loved this. He probably was lapping this up, that he was able to encourage his own supporters to, to stage a coup on the Capitol. For a lot of people, obviously, there was always a question mark over whether these ideas and this presidency might slip into political violence. And increasingly, there is a view that America is headed into a situation where political violence is simply becoming a permanent feature of the political system. That's not a surprising thing to say, given the levels of polarization in American politics, but it is a deeply worrying thing to observe. For several hours, rioters looted and ransacked congressional offices in the Capitol building as officials hid out in bunkers underground. Across the world, people looked on in shock as the beacon of democracy fell victim to Trumpism. State police from nearby regions were called into the Washington DC area to clear the area and ensure the transfer of power could occur peacefully. By 8 p.m., the Capitol was declared free of rioters and Vice President Pence called the Senate back into sessions. After a day of despair across Washington, D.C., Congress certified Joe Biden as the next president. Justice was restored, but American democracy had been tarnished forever. We should be really concerned about the trajectory of American politics, about what the future holds. Democracy, I think, is not inevitable. It's not irreversible. We know that democracies can backslide. We've seen it. We've seen it in Hungary. We've seen it in Poland. We've seen it in Brazil. And we're seeing that in the United States as well. We're, we're witnessing a democratic decline. And that's deeply concerning. After the chaos of January the 6th, Donald Trump returned to his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida to enjoy his retirement from being the most powerful man in the world, by playing golf, of course. Unfortunately for Trump, the chaos associated with his time in office would set the tone for his post-election years. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Has become the first former United States president to face criminal charges in the documents mishandling case. 
for his attempt to overturn the results of an election. The case in New York relates to alleged hush money payments to an adult entertainer. On state charges stemming from his efforts to overturn Joe Biden's victory over him in the November 2020 election in Georgia. Uh, this is uh, historic. Uh, this is the fourth time Donald Trump has been indicted. It's one of those days when um, you both think like, wow, this is, this is happening in my generation, in my lifetime. We're the first people to see federal criminal charges against a former president. For the first 234 years of US history, no American president or former president had ever been indicted. That changed in 2023. Over a four and a half month period, from March until August 2023, Donald Trump was charged in four criminal cases. In New York, he faced 34 felony counts in connection with hush money payments to a porn star. In Florida, he faced 40 felony counts for hoarding classified documents and impeding efforts to retrieve them. In Washington, D.C., he faced four felony counts for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election. And in Georgia, he faced 13 felony counts for his election interference in that state. And even after all the charges were laid out, Trump's supporters were still on his side and with each indictment were becoming more loyal than ever before. The ultra-MAGA crowd were out in force, backing Trump to win the next election. I'm here to support the 45th president, of course. Why not? To be what is now the mainstream of the Republican Party, which is you know, the Trump part of the Republican Party, it's not, it's not about where you stand on policy. It's not a policy position. It's essentially determined about your position on Trump and the 2020 election. So to be part of the, the Trump crowd, to be part of this group, you have to be an election denier. That's it. That's a litmus test. It's not a policy test. It's a, it's, it's, you have to show your allegiance to Trump. What's more incredible, perhaps, is that Trump is not an outcast now. He's not been thrown out by the Republican Party. He's still the most important person in the party, and that he may, in 2024, be re-elected President of the United States. A Trump II presidency would look quite different. I think Trump has already talked quite openly about the things he would do differently with regard to tackling the deep state. I will shatter the deep state and restore government that is controlled by the people and for the people. Thank you. He wants to try and create a new layer of administrators and officials who would be much more loyal to Team Trump. And I will wield that power very aggressively. Something very odd is happening in American politics today where we can have a situation where a, a president, a sitting president, tries to steal an election. That everybody, that all legitimate authorities said was, was not stolen, that Biden was a legitimate winner. And then, four years later, he could possibly become president again. That's remarkable. This is the year we are going to take back the House. We are going to take back the Senate. And in 2024, we are going to take back the White House. And we are going to take back America.